This is a production of Cornell University. This talk is kind of an overview of my topic of topics, and it's not a specific research that can be finished or trying to present some conclusions to the research. It's mostly my experiment going out with what I think about that and trying to find some way to communicate with the broader non-biology community and find some help or some collaborative future interaction for the for research that I do. And this particular presentation, I have to start from the end. The end. Don't get too excited. I will speak for another 40 minutes, so it's a But why from the end? Because this is not the this is not my effort really. This is an effort of many people that are spread all over six continents and speaking 20 or more languages and they are really the ones that made this possible by putting up my questions and my annoying being pretty much annoying with them trying to force them to help me. And also this is an effort of everybody in the room in the form of the, the taxpayer, as long as you pay taxes. Not then you know the country paper to this research. And I have to also pay my respect to the 19th century capitalism and the Mellon Foundation that started my research in this area. So since I started from the end, I will not give a title to the talk. And when we look at the background like this, when we go to the, to the field, everybody sees something different. Some people see volcanoes, some people see snow, thinking about skiing. And when I go there, I see plants, mostly big trees. And even more, I see the specific part of the plant, the, the conductive tissue. And when I look at it, I always ask the question, what makes plant a plant? What makes the plant to be a single organism that has its hundreds or sometimes thousands of uh, distal organs placed on the branches and millions of rootlets in the soil and how they function all together as a unit. How do they function without having a neural network, without having a brain? So from our animal perspective, we think everything should have somehow translated the signals of the environment to make it respond to the environment in a coordinated manner. And here we have the plant that doesn't have that kind of ability to anticipate or perceive the environmental cues, ship them to one place, digest them, make this information decision, and then spread them back to say, okay, we need to do this or that in this particular region of the plant. And when I think about it, what makes plant a plant, the most amazing part of this is that whatever we go to field right now, especially around the corner, you go to the forest and you see not plants, you just see the tubes that conduct water covered by bark and the tubes that conduct sugar under the bark during the summer. Right now they're not doing much, but they just stand there. You see basically big conductive tissue. You see the huge microfluidic device. And to give you the kind of a feeling what is this scale of this microfluidic device, you can look at those numbers. Four million kilometers in, of tubes are in the single eucalyptus tree, which is 10 times distance to the moon. And 30 trees, put all the tubes from a tree will reach the sun, which is eight minutes of light travel, which is a huge amount of microfluidic system, way more than humans have in form of their vessels system. And this xylem tissue is also matched by the, a little bit shorter, but by flying transport, transport sugars from the big it is. It means that those transport tissue, they have to somehow, in my opinion at least, interact and pre create a system response. This is, this is this part of the call right now. This is a new word. 
emergent properties. This system of the tree has this emergent properties, this transport system has emergent properties of coordination among those distal parts of the plant. So the observation that I had kind of over the last 10 years of working with plants, that all, almost all the biological responses that I studied have always byproduct in forms of the hydraulic properties adjustment or changes in hydraulic properties, whether it's leaf, roots, xylem, tissue, or phloem, there is always, no matter what kind of element we study, whether it's nitrate, sugar transport, whatever we study, there is always a component of hydraulics. And I try to convey the message that this hydraulic component may be the fast dynamic part of the microbiome of this macro fluidic system in the plant that can allow for well increasing increased well-being of the plant. Basically can make the plant function in a more efficient way. So the puzzle that we have is we have those all levels. And the difficulty of studying this kind of a question or this kind of a paradigm is that we have to study To show. But anyway, we have this puzzle at different scales, from molecular scale, from subcellular scale, scale to true to medium scales of several centimeters when we have tissues interact to hold, let's say in my case, I like three, so to hold three, and how we can combine all those elements together is a big question. Challenge, technical challenge. So first I will try to explain, or not say, just put you in a, through the way how I thought about it, why I came up with this idea that they have to, this microbiome system has to be a part of the informational system in a tree by, in a tree by looking at three different unique parts of, of the, the, three different unique uh, responses of plant to particular environmental triggers and how they translate to water adjustment, hydraulics of plants, and how they can eventually meet the, the this premise of emergent properties at the whole plant scale. So I will go through three examples, root nitrate uptake, sugar transport, and concentration of CO2 in the leaves. And this is the first, it's about root uptake and nitrate uptake by roots. One of the observations that I made recently was that when we apply nitrate to previously a little bit starved, nitrate starved plants, of course nitrate presence will trigger nitrate transporters and nitrate will be taken up by root. But at the same time, we notice that plant increase extremely, I mean extremely, but within very few seconds, like within 30 seconds, changes its hydraulic properties of roots by allowing more water to flow through the membranes of parenchyma cells in roots. And this, this two slides show tomato and cucumber at the, 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 the A and B shows tomato and cucumber response to nitrate addition to the solid solution. And then the blue line shows the increase versus control green line, show the increase of flux through the root completely unrelated to any changes of, of driving force. This was not caused by change in driving force, i.e. pressure gradient or osmotic gradient across the road. It was just changed by the cellular adjustment of cell cell properties, which is the lower graph shows the, the test of the half-time water flow through cell membrane in the parenchyma cells. And the bars show that application of nitrate to roots we require require cost to drop in the resistance of membrane to water flow. So here we have this nitrate application resulting in the change in the properties of hydraulic properties of plant. And so what causes at the molecular level this change? We are thinking it was of course aquaphorics, but we were trying to find out what, how this signal of nitrate translate is, what, what creates the change in micro, in, in membrane component 
for the part of this nitrate transport part to create the change. And this is, we use the tank state thread, the tank state applications to decide whether we're trying to block the uh, nitrate assimilation part with tank state, hoping that maybe some byproduct of nitrate from nitrate assimilation part will let us decide which part of the pathway is responsible for adjusting water component of the water uptake by plant. And we successfully stop the response of nitrate on cucumber, but not on tomato, with tank state. When we checked, well, in both cases, the nitrate, active nitrate, the nitrate assimilation path was blocked in both cases, but in case of the cucumber, we also noticed that we blocked the uptake nitrate transporters into the plant application of plant state. So they gave us a very nice simple experiment to see which part of the pathway is responsible for the for changes in aquaporin activity. Because plant state in, in tomato, the upper one, shows the nitrate in tomato, tank state in tomato blocked the, the nitrate assimilation path, but did not do anything to, to block the aquaporin activity. When we change, when in, when in cucumber, when in cucumber, we, change, we block nitrate transporters, and at the same time we block the acti activity of aquaporin at the same time. So they, they did not, not block the activity they did not respond to the presence of nitrate. So it was obvious that nitrate inside the cell is responsible for increasing the conductance of the membrane. So we injected nitrate to the backbone of the cells and we get back the, we activate the aquaporins and increase the water flow to the cell. So this gave us the kind of a short insight of the cell, but at that point I, because I am a whole plant biologist, I kind of let this go to the people in my lab to try to study what molecular level responses are involved in this type of response. But I went to bigger picture, try to understand why plants would bother to change nitrate activity with, by adjusting the water flow. And this is an overview of the concept that we had is that in, when there is no nitrate present, plant basically takes up water and nitrate is, if they are available in the soil. However, when, when suddenly in one place, nitrate, which is a mobile nutrient in the soil, shows up due to the rain event or some activity of microbes around one part of the root system, it, plant would like to take it up, but as it triggers up the nitrate transporters, upregulates nitrate transporters, it might deplete the nitrate presence in the surface of the root. So it would be beneficial for plants to bring more nitrate toward the root by increasing the flux rate of water. So if a plant can change the flux rate toward the root, then it would be automatically increasing availability of nitrate. So it's a feed forward effect. And when over time plant nitrate is in presence this mobile nutrient will shift from one spot to another. Plant can turn off one resistance, I mean, turn off the uptake of water in one part of the root system, move it to another part when the nitrate is present, and again, benefit from having the flow rate toward the root. And this was the concept, so we then tested it on hydroponics when we built a new system, two roots, split root system, two balances, and then we provide one part of the root with the with the nitrate and you can see on those graphs that there was immediately met by increased water uptake from this part of the root when the other part dropped down the uptake of water such as because the need of plant is collecting water from where the hydrate is and when we rotated the roots they immediately switched back and nitrate again the plant with nitrate the root with nitrate presence was able to take up more water with nitrate when the other one was shut down. Which gives us the feeling that this is an interesting example of seemingly unrelated processes, nitrate uptake and water up, when one is really increasing
increasing the potential of the other. Turning on the water up from nitrate gave us the, ch gave the plant the chance to take up, to benefit from taking up more nitrates when the nitrate is available. But also it gives us the static distribution of roots in the soil with mobile nutrient that can shift from time to, to from place to place or can be triggered by microbial activity in different places due to temperature differences or water availability differences. This can allow plant, despite being immobile, to chase nutrients by adaptation of physiological activity. You turn on here, roots and the nutrients in the other corner. So this is one of the examples of how plant can adjust hydraulics to seemingly non-related physiological activity. So we can put together two pieces of puzzle at two different levels from molecular or cellular level to whole root or part of, part of the root system level. The other example that comes from my study is the interaction between sugar transport and xylem transport. This is a very simplified view of what happens, but when sugar is transported, <laughs> in, there is expectation that there is some ions being recycled over time to maintain the shoot flow from the shoot to the root. And interestingly, when this happens, those ions goes from, from phloem, they goes from phloem to xylem tubes and flow up back to the cells at the top of the plant. And this is interesting because those phloem, those phloem, sorry, the, the presence of ions in the xylem can change the resistance of the xylem itself. So those dead tubes that are in the phloem in the xylem they conduct water, and for a long time they were assumed that they are permanent fixtures, that, that they like act like pipes, but they, like 10 years ago, we find out that they're not acting like mere pipes. They, they are also dynamic, they can adapt their resistance to water flow in the design. They can adapt resistance to presence of ions in the xylem that can come from the xylem interaction. And these are the graphs that shows increasing flow rate of, of in the xylem, different concentration of potassium in the, in the sub, and, and percent of relative flow rate in the, in the, due to the, in the, in the, in the xylem tubes. And this was later on we show that this is really related to border pit membrane properties. These are border pits that, link, that are links between two adjacent vessels in the plant. One of them here, one of those border pits. Must be very dry. One of the border pits here is open and you can see through, so this water flows to one side, to the other side of the vessel, to another vessel element through those water pits that are composed of, the hybrid materials composed of many fibers, gels, and, and the potentially some pores. And when we look at closer, closer at those pores, they are, this is a recent AFM analysis of the border pit itself, when those two fuzzy images shows two different moments, two different uh, properties of border pit membranes. The one on the left shows that the membrane is produced. This is this is phase. I think this is. This is the this is the uh, elevation image of the. AFM, atomic force microscopy, when we probe the surface of it, and you can see that this is this is kind of a flat surface, very difficult to to to, to distinguish anything underneath this this fiber structure of the border pit membrane is hidden under the gel kind of material, and when we expose it to feed the micromolar 
concentration of base yield is gel in those border plates, it collapses, making it much more strict and much harder surface and much more features on it. We have potential to see the the, the border, the, the fibers, these are black lines here, they and also you can, see, you can see kind of long. Quick clarification, you said 50 micromolar. Millimolar. Millimolar. Sorry, in this case it's 50 millimolar. Yeah. But because we wanted to get it very strong. Usually in plants it goes from, few, from, from 2 millimolar to 7 millimolar. Here it's, we wanted to see the big change and we did see it. And it, this change collapsed the gel to make the surface much stiffer, but at the same time much more permeable to, to water. <clears throat> and again, this is at the microscope. This, this, those images were showing this LF, this, this interaction of ions being recycled from flow and at the mi and, and then microscale level change at the, at the structure of water membranes. And when we look at the whole plant level, we can try to understand why plant bother to change this micro micro fluidic properties of this microfluidic system for is there any, is there any physiological meaning for it or biological <laughs> meaning for well being of the whole plant. To do it we did a long time ago with Peter Melter here. We did this study of when we took the plant this was a tobacco plant, we took parts of the xylem, attached them to, to tubes, and then we flow, in one case, the eye water, in other way, the eye water and then we substituted the eye water with artificial sap, composed of true whatever we can read in the book, how, with artificial sap. And then the moment we substituted it with the artificial sap, the part with the substitution was increased dramatically the flux rate of water from that particular part of the plant, allowing to say that the composition of salt can really change the rate of utilization of water through this particular part of xylem. When we go back to the water, the resistance increased and the water update decreased from this particular zone. So this is a really complicated system. I, this was everything so far was done kind of outside the plant or in case of with artificial sap. Here I wanted to decide is it true that by dealing with or changing the property of transporting flow and I can induce changes in xylem rate of water delivery to the plant. So this is a setup where plant was tortured in extreme ways by the fact that it was pressurized in the roof, it was on the balance, and we changed the light condition, humidity in the top, to, and to affect the flux. And then it was also, the flux was girdled to change the way that um, uh, to, to induce the flux, to, to, to force plants to stop transporting the flux. And eventually, we were able to measure between two transducers, E1 and E2, we are able to measure resistance of the island and also determine from the rate of water flow in the plant, which allow us to find out that indeed with moment when flow was disturbed, the resistance of xylem increased dramatically. So it is com completely related one to the other, that as long as plant can recycle ions, it can maintain can maintain uh, preferable xylem flux conditions if it cannot transport ions. I mean, the recycled ions to the plant, from plant to xylem, the resistance of plants to, to water flow dramatically increases. And how does this play a role in the whole plant environment interaction? That's, that's an example that I can think about, but I would like to later on to, to, to study in detail. But in shade conditions, with all those aspects of low photosynthetic activity, low export rate, low ion circulation, this result in high resistance to water flow. So those parts of plants that are in shade, they will not get water. 
in opposite situation when one of the part, one part of the plant is exposed to sun, this entire activity of transport and recycling of ions increases the capability or capacity of xylem for water transport and can enhance water delivery to most productive plant parts. So this is again a system where those minuscule changes or unrelated, seemingly unrelated part of plant biology like flow and transport and recycling of ions can force or can make induce the increased productivity of plant in areas when plant really needs this particular sun situation. And you can envision that over time when the sun is going in the forest, different parts of the tree crown will be exposed to sun at different times. And only those that are getting most light will be most supplied with water and ions from the, from the soil. Third, so we can, this is another part is we can put together again the cellular level or subcellular level information with tissue level adjustments that can improve plant performance. Next example is coming from leaves. This is something that I am studying currently, so I don't have a nice description of it. However, when leaves are, com I mean, they, they compose, this is, you know, they compose of a lot of cells, but mesophyll cells and conductive tissue cells. And when we look at them, the interesting aspect that we're finding out right now is that presence of CO2 inside cells changes the aquaporin activity in the cells too. This is again a byproduct of aquaporin activity that allow or stop water being delivered to epidermal cells or changes resistance of water being delivered from xylem to epidermal cells of plants. And interest, the interesting part is that the more CO2 there is in the leaf, the more resistant is the pathway between xylem and, and, and stomata. And the more resistant is this pathway, it means that Stomata has harder time to get water, so if there is any loss of water, they will shut faster. And how this would play the whole well-being of, of, of leaf? It might be that when it might be that leaves that are in the shade, i.e., they are not productive, they have increased level of CO2 because there is no much photosynthesis in the leaves. So if those leaves can reduce the loss of water, then they will automatically preserve this water for most productive leaves that need water and they can lose a lot of water. So if they reduce the water loss due to the fact that they can higher CO2 concentration around them, then they will be able to utilize this water in other parts of the plant, similar to adjustment of resistance in the side. So this is the third puzzle. I mean, two puzzles together. Again, you have cellular component, CO2 uptake, but at the same time, it translates itself to aquaporin activity and affects the ability of leaves to photosynthesize and loss water. So, in this case, we have the those, those little elements, small research components, getting us to another step: is emerging properties of the entire system. How those little Parts and create a plant that is responsive to environmental cues in an, and trigger some higher level and organismal level adjustments. So this is the question that I have, how to understand the vascular network that is composed of just millions of kilometers of, of, of vessels and millions of cells that compose that provide capacitors for water and there are those resistances between cells and this is just, a, I should just make it a bit bigger picture, but this is just a small part of the, of the equation. And to start it, we, we have this problem that all those, this research has to be done on vessels that conduct water under tension. So any disturbance to it makes it pop, that it just stop the transport or they done in the phloem, which is under positive pressure, but any disturbance to it also stops the flow at least temporarily. And interestingly, 
anything that I try to do is met by uh, this, this, this fact that this is from the methodological challenges is very well confirmed by all the reviewers that I have to meet on my way. It's, and this is no additional charge, just send you letters that are longer than your paper saying why something's wrong with the methods. But unfortunately, they never say what I should improve. They only criticize it, but that's okay. <laughs> so fighting a bit, I, I have to, why this is difficult? Because scales of observation, we have to observe something at micro scale and, and somehow translate it to tens of meters of the tree. There's, as I mentioned before, that those are, everything is in the plant, every transport is intracellular. There is really no extracellular transport. Xylem vessels are cells and plaque happens inside, not outside. Plaques happens inside the plant tube, so everything is small. And they are under tension and they are under high pressure. So what we can do? I tried, so this is a long-term project, so it started many years ago. And I think that H. Strokey recognized this legal device on the left with the hobby. That's his first attempt to measure or this created tension in the microbiome in my biomimicking device when we are trying to measure load of, of generate transpiration in microfluidic device and, and measure tension for the first time in the, in the this, this was uh, not silly by what was this PDMS. And of course the moment we did this the first thing we always get was embodies at the time when we connect me to the tube, there was an embolism and no more, this didn't function well. But, so the next step I did with uh, Xavier Noblin was to develop an artificial lead where we were trying to generate fluxes not through the lead, real lead, but through the vaporized pump. And all, all those examples of what I tried to do, they end up with some kind of a more or less published material, except that they did not yet contribute to the answering the major question how it not function. But I hope that I can. But like this one, this this paper, this, this evaporative device allowed us to create a better understanding of vein, vein spacing in the plant. What drives the white oak leaf at eight millimeters of vein this Vein, eight millimeters of veins per square millimeters of deep tissue versus, let's say, uh, in Copland that have one millimeter of vein per millimeter of surface of the. This device allowed us to de design or better understand the scaling law of the nation leaves. The other part, so this is this is kind of an overview of method that I tried to develop to understand the. So this is biomimicking of the device that we bio that we try to understand the blood flow in using the first micro microfluidic device when we are able to separate two two micro channels with the semi-permeable membrane and analyze the rate of flow versus the concentration of sugars and size of the plant tubes, which gave us the ability to predict why certain plants have the tubes that are like white cucumber has a 50 micron diameter plant tube when the eucalyptus tree has in the trunk has about 15 micrometer diameter tube or why tomato has 25 micron diameter plant tube despite the different sizes, different distances that this part is transported and this is a scaling law that we develop when we can predict the, the leaf size i.e. the loading zone for, 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 for photosynthesis to apply is related to, to I mean, times one third of the power of the stem length gives us the predicted ray, radius of the, of the plant tube which is kind of an interesting finding that can that spans across a lot of different sizes of plants from Arabidopsis to the chemical industry Also, so the, these are the biomimicking part. Now I try to develop methods that will allow me to look inside the plant. And this is one of the methods that I 
called the remote access methods. This is remote access to fly and flow, where I load the die into the leaps and then am able to follow up due to the bleaching of die the rate of movement of die in front, allowing me to, to determine the, the rate of flow and hopefully also to decide later on, not right now yet, but later on to create the to expose those plants to environmental triggers to see how flow and flow, flow rate directly affects of the particular hydraulic properties of the plant. This, this, okay. this is another part I try to look into the leaps when I try to measure the rate of flow of water into the leaf to have to, to, to determine if I trigger a particular part, like if I change the availability of CO2 in it, how this water flow in particular parts of the will change. So this is a movie that shows that I'm capable right now of measuring the distribution of water across the leaf. Again, I am missing this little part yet, how to get to CO2 exchange. This is another part. So this is leaves, this is stem. This is the work that we did on trying to look inside the stem of the plant using MRI. And this movie shows, it's kind of shows very short. You can see this black little kind of a sorry again. This little black speck going through the plant right now. This is an embody formation in the plant. So this plant was under stress. This plant was in MRI, and at one point, without disturbance from my, from us to the plant, there was a particular event that showed that there was embody that later on disappeared. This so MRI proved to be very powerful tool to look into the well-being and water distribution in the stem, which gains us the ability to look at what happens to water, in this case the blue is not water, but blue is air. What happens to air inside the plant during the embodies events? How, how is it distributed in three-dimensional scale over time? And how it disappears, which proves, first of all, that embodies can be revealed, but also shows us that we can look at macro-scale and micro-scale events that happens in the plant. So this is another, now we're going Below ground, this is another part of this leaf system. This is root access, where when we make an on-time observation of water uptake by root, you can see that water disappears from root and shows we can calculate how much water at what time is being taken up by one particular plant. And this is the Two pictures here. It's after two hours. The color, the brighter color, the color the red. More water was being taken up at that particular time from particular zone. So and you can see that two hours in, the part, in this particular system, we have a shift of water uptake from the top to the bottom. And again, I this technique is developed to hope to make it possible to put together some additional. Like add the nitrate to, to this system and see how this nitrate will influence water uptake from the soil. The problem, okay, so there is another part. So there's more, more of those. There's insider insight, I call it, because then we try to do to look in, inside the plant at very micro scale, at very small levels to see droplets in vessels or how the leaf look like inside during the active transpiration. These are the yes, SEM pictures. So they don't really show the active or real life elements, but at least they gave us the feeling how the environment looks like. So when we try to model it later on, we can get the true dimensions from the system and learn how they interact with the environment. And direct access to plants. This is a microprobe that we poke into the diet. And the pressure graph here shows that I was poking, going in the xylem probe pressure to the plant, and eventually I forced it 
to, to generate some tension and most likely embolizes a little bit because it's a deep probe. And then over time, interestingly, <coughs> the pressure probe reached the higher and higher pressure of almost the two bars. And at the end, I, I, I was not in the room in that part. No one was in the room. It suddenly hit what I call the repeating moment go down to negative pressures and embolize again. So this was this is an example of direct access to silent and observation of embolism repeating. And last the moment, this is the last kind of slide here. This is I try to overlay all those physical measurements of system on whole transcriptome analysis, check what genes are being triggered at particular physical events. Even during the during the hunt, I mean, if, if we force particular spots, like force M, this is slide talk about embodies repair. If we force plant to embody and then wait for repeating, we can check what pathways and what uh, particular processes are being upregulated due to this response. So each of those techniques that I use. requires some kind of a miracle to happen. Each one is extremely complicated. And I call every, every research a miracle. And when we have 10 different aspects to measure simultaneously, it's a huge miracle. Here we have to measure 50 or 60 different elements simultaneously at a big macro scale. And it's extremely interesting from the perspective of how to do it. And I don't know how to do it yet this way, going around us people. And put together the picture how this plant is capable of responding to lock of stimuli and how this lock of stimuli spread across the hydraulic system and how they interact with other kinds of stimuli in the system, how they create this hydro, I call it a hydroinformatics, how they do this hydroinformatics that allow plants to interact with the environment. And create the create shape of a tree that, that, that is well adjusted to plant to the environment, and how those changes influence the fluxes inside <coughs> the plant and make the plant work all together. And so now, sorry, now I can go to the beginning, which is plant micromasters. So and say how this hydraulic integrated local plant responses are making plant are making plant vascular system to be the dynamic coordinator of everything that happens in the plant. Very narrow, very short scales. And I I know I'm not too long, hopefully. Four to five minutes. <laughs>
to understand what's happening. So in these, it's been more difficult. But for the, for example, the structure of the internal structure of these makes the boundary condition extremely. I mean, it's not extreme. It just makes it more difficult to model than the final. But it's, it's true. I mean, modeling with the model. Yeah. Do you have a hypothesis about how CO2 affects aquaporin activity? Uh, this is, as I said, this is kind of we started to do it recently, so we don't have the hypothesis of how the, we, I don't have the, the clear view how those events of, of, of the nitric uptake, how they directly affect aquaporin. It, it would require probably one postdoc or two graduate students to do direct you know, analysis of, of expression as of genes or activity of proteins and I don't I don't even imagine how to start thinking about the signaling molecules which ones are being responsible for it. We can probably predict whether concentration of sugars are important or what what whether pH in the cell walls due to CO2 concentration might be important which is a possibility because pH was shown to affect aquaporin. So you increase CO2 level changes, pH of water in the apoplast might influence aquaporin activity. But which part of it is responsible for the center? I don't know. So CO2 might also affect pH of the It can affect, yeah, I mean, on the, on the way to, yeah. or proton pumps inside. I mean, there is a lot of things that CO2 can affect. Just a very general question, but the experiments that you do are almost seem to be directed toward trees. Probably yeah. because well, from but in, in any case, do do you do you do similar experiments on herbaceous plants, really small plants, and do you see qualitative differences? They, I, they can, I show trees because I like them, but unfortunately most of the, my work was done on unfortunately. On the herbaceous plant. I mean, I do for semi herbaceous plant, but we work with cucumber, tomato, uh, tobacco, uh, soybean, and poplar, and many other trees. I, I'm kind of a question driven, not specific plant driven. So if I have a question and I go upstairs to the greenhouse on the roof, and I find a plant. It's good for me. I learn the name later. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I really don't mind what I'm studying to put on. It can be any plant that is there. And often we have, I, I just don't, I just go there and just take the first plant that I can, you know, this looks nice, this one. And then I ask the people what the time I study. These are different plants. I am not plant specific. But I like trees. Since I work at Arnold Arboreto, I like trees, so I always show the trees. Yes. So it seems to me one of the problems with modeling is you latch on to some idea and then you model everything around that. And you, as a result, you may have all something else that might be more important. But the, the instance uh, is that struck me is when you had shade versus sea sun leaves, leaves in the shade versus in the sun. Most of the water was going to the leaf in the sun. You suggested that this was because the leaf was photosynthesizing, altered the level of CO2, the CO2 altered the water flow. But the most important thing with regard to transpiration is going to be temperature and your shade leaf is not going to be at such a high temperature as the sun leaf. Could you not explain this entire movement on the basis of temperature influence on transpiration rather than going and worrying about the small changes you're likely to get in CO2? I, I'm not trying to explain the level of transpiration. I'm trying to explain the resistance. Yes, of course, the sun temperature, there will be more transpiration in the sun leaf. And if you have a constant resistance, let's say one, 
the drop of pressure with particular level of flow, you would have, I don't know, another one, that's the one megapascal drop across the pathway. However, if you can drop this resistance half, then you, for the same transpiration rate, your dropping pressure would be only half. So you're, you will be able, or plant will be able to keep stomata open to sustain this transpiration without dropping the pressure. So what I'm trying to say is not how does this influence the transpiration rate, but how plant can redistribute limited resources between parts of plants to most productive ones. So yes, I wanted to be transpiring as much, but I wanted to do the low pressure drop so they don't need to chop shut the matter. If you increase resistance, the load is such that it, suddenly there will be not enough water capacity, transport capacity to preside and stomata will shut. Transpiration will be the same, but there will be no production because there is no CO2 out there. Okay, so it's not about how much water goes to particular parts, but how one can manipulate and redistribute water between the parts. Right at the beginning of your talk, when we were talking about sort of thousands of buds and repeated parts of plants, I was immediately thinking of beehives. And that, you know, sort of, to some degree, it's sort of a hive organism, all these different, uh, you know, in individually capable parts, but somehow achieving its coordination. So, <clears throat> to what extent do you think that, you know, as you're modeling the resistance of your, your examples tended to focus on sort of the, proximal uh, functional aspects of what was happening locally in the changes of existence. But to what extent do you see that as sort of a long distance communication pattern, sort of like the bee dance, uh, where the patterns of resistance and the resulting hydraulic properties, patterns of water potential are actually sort of a, a communications network that allow the different parts of the plant to coordinate. Yes, yeah, so, so as I said, this is a developing project. Yes, I do think, that there, you know that there were a lot of capacitors on this schematic. And of course, if you, if you have this system with some capacitor which sells certain capacitors, the spread of hydraulic signal or changes in the, in the distribution of tension in the tree or changes in distribution of pressure in the flow will not be instantaneous across the plant. They will happen in time. And then depending on the disturbance level, they can disappear at certain distance. So yes, the, the degree of the response or the, the way that plant is constructed or the capacitors of the, of the system, they will influence the spread of hydraulic adjustment of the plant. And in, in any way, this is, I think that this hydraulic can serve as a kind of a fast dynamic first level response, it will be later matched by all kind of chemical responses that, that are required by physical delivery of something from one part of the plant to another, and it is probably another level of, 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 of response that I am not studying, but it would be very interesting to see how it changes in distribution. The fast response much later is much later on by by the hormone distribution and, and other signaling molecule distribution. But I do think that it's not it's not on the short distance local chain, but it spreads if, if one part of the root changes the water potential inside the root, this signal or I would call it signal, but this the change in one part because it's interconnected will influence distribution of potentials or tension in the entire system. Other questions here? Other questions in Geneva? Uh, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for a really uh, thought-provoking type of a seminar you know, going and really a cellular all the way to the kind of explain things more on a full time basis. On the very first section that you had with the root uptake and, and the nitrate, and maybe I just missed some of the details, but what, what was the concentration where you're seeing these influx or the changes in, in the flux rate of the water uptake? So de depending on the plant, we 
we were trying to to use plants that are having less nitrate than in the cropland. So basically between one and below one millimolar of nitrate in the field conditions. And when we change it to above one millimolar, they were already responding to it. We, later on, we used basically 0.5 millimolar and 5 millimolar as kind of a fast, fast rate of change. But we tried to use the more natural environment concentration for nitrate than the crop. Right. Other questions? I think you may have shown it, but I don't remember how, uh, how rapid on the, uh, uh, the response to the internal hydraulic resistance in the, uh, the leaf with the sun versus shade. Uh, how quickly would that respond? Because if we have, uh, for example, clouds go over or you know, the sun moves and leaves go in and out of shade, uh, how quickly did that response occur? And was it equally reversible? Rate. Yeah. You mean the aquaponics in the leaf in shape? Yeah. So this is, I don't have right now the dynamics of it, and how fast it happens. Right now we are at the level of enthusiastic, wow, that we can, the CO2 affects it. So basically we collect, we, we, we do mostly the physical, we can measure the response within several minutes right now. Maybe it can take it faster, but I cannot get higher time resolution. So we see the first evidence of it in several minutes. The change in aquaporium activity. So how do you keep apart the effect of the nitrate on the root water uptake and then the effect of the nitrate on the hydrogel shrinking? Uh, very easy. Uh, what I did, I cut the roots, applied the nitrate at the same concentration, and I found um, the effect of like 10% or less versus the fluxes that were manipulated by, by nitrate with undamaged roots that are 40 or 60%, which are such as that it was mostly re and resulted from the root and also the resistance of the radial resistance of the root in this particular case is about 50 times higher than the resistance of internal diamond. So 10% change in diamond sum translates to less than one tenth of a percent, two tenths of a percent of the total resistance of plants. So it was means for comparing to what the plant was doing in response to my water. And then I have a second question to that. So what about the root capital? Why is this here zone where there's gel there, is that responding to ions and affecting water absorption at all? Or have you had a chance to throw like different salts on to the system to see if you're the Mike, Mike, a long time ago I was trying to analyze where water is being taken up by root and nothing was being taken up in the zone of, at least in the roots that I was studying in the zone of root camp. So everything was just behind, not behind very close to sugarized zone. Like 80 to 90 percent of water was flowing close to sugarized zone when the tip of the root, the growing part of the root, was responsible for less than 5 percent of water uptake. So even big changes in the cup properties would probably have minimal effect on the water uptake. It might change in the dry soils when the root growth is very, very short and still the polysaccharides are surrounding the active part of root uptake stuff, but I didn't study. Well, uh, Matra will be here through tomorrow. If you uh, would like to uh, get a meeting with him, that's probably possible. I'll see you uh, come up after um, right now. Um, let's thank Matra again for us. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.